Welcome back, travelers, to Legendary Lore, where today we are going to be finishing up the Brothers War story, finally. And this is really cool because it's a moment where we get to see the past and the present kind of merge together in this one story. You see, throughout the entirety of the past, we had moments where we saw Teferi show up as a spirit. And then throughout the present, we saw that they were trying to defend him from the Phyrexians. So really, that's what we're seeing here. There, there's a moment where they're kind of laying out what the plan is revealing everything, explaining everything from Teferi's side of the story. And so Teferi's inside the little coffin. He's kind of freaking out about it. Like he's very uneasy, but he knows it's probably the best move. And they did a lot of research into the Golgothi and Silex to try and like, you know, figure out what they were going to do with it, which is why we have this whole thing right here where it says, the Silex had first been created or discovered by Felden, a scholar of languages and ancient glaciers, some decades before the Brothers' War. At the same time, it had also been created by Ashnod, card from the skull cap of the Kadir, her master Mishra, replace. Also, it had been pulled from old Phyrexia's deepest ichor well by Gix, a demon who slouched to Dominaria out from dreams of steel and oil. Also, the Silex had been chiseled from a giant's tooth and kept by the kobolds of the Kurs, as well as it was one of Tal's hardened tears. The spell frozen corona of a falling star, the melted heart of a mountain hammered into the shape by certain dwarves, and so on and so on. Basically, nobody has any idea what it's actually from. Everybody has their own myth for what this thing is to explain where this great power came from. So we see Teferi talking about the way to find it, which is essentially he looks through time and he can see it like imagine a timeline kind of thing. And you see these dark gashes where entire lives, futures essentially were cut short. And usually he's, those are wars. The problem is the Brothers' War was years, decades long. And as a result, there's just these gashes throughout Dominaria's history of these gigantic deadly wars. And he doesn't know which one is which. So that's why he wound up at all these different spots. He was specifically going to areas with large amounts of people dying. The first one was more of a test run. That's when he showed up in, the, in that Warlords uh, and Krug. The thing is that he was in the right place, but in the wrong time as far as one of the wars. Then he showed up back in, in the area nearby that was in the right, in a closer time, but not still not the right place. Until eventually he gets all the way to Argoth, where we're now taking taking the story from. So here it says, Teferi is here. He says, Teferi's had eight with all his temporal resorting. He hadn't slept well in weeks. Or maybe he did. Maybe he had been asleep this whole time. He didn't quite remember. So he he himself, despite being so well-versed with time, he's getting a little scrambled. He's a little all over the place. He's just constantly like leaving his body, going into the time stream. Then he comes back and he's just kind of out of it. And he's trying his best. It's extremely exhausting on him and on the machinery itself, but he's doing everything he can. And so eventually he does get to an area that is worth mentioning. So now we've reached 63 AR. AR stands for Argothian Reckoning. What's really cool about this set is that they have basically covered each of the different years by showing us which year AR they are. AR stands for Argothian Reckoning. The basic idea is that the beginning of the Argothian Reckoning, the year zero would be Urza's birth. Essentially, Urza was so influential to this world that that's when they basically keep track of their years. And so this is 63 AR. Obviously, during their time frame, that wouldn't be what they called it. It also wouldn't be what they did, but that's just how it goes normally with time. So here we have 63 AR. And it says, Urza sat cross-legged with the bowl in his lap. The runes within the bowl spiraled toward the center. Blood from the gushing wound on his forehead dribbled into the bowl and filled the carved runes with crimson. Here's what's really cool. This part right here, this story that we're reading is actually parts of it show up in the Brothers War novel. So basically they took scenes from the Brothers War novel and then they put it into this story so that we are able to actually read the Brothers War ending with a new context as Teferi is now a part of this story. He's watching everything happen as it goes around. So here we have this whole deal where Urz is uh, doing this thing Kaya's doing her uh, thing, talking to Tef uh, Teferi. Sahili's trying to keep everything running the way it's supposed to. And so basically Teferi's telling everything as it goes. The blood from the cut on her forehead is dripping into the bowl, filling the runes. He's sitting cross-legged. And so they're, they're, they're basically getting through everything. Kaya's trying to get everything across to Sahili so that she understands what's happening. Then it talks about Mishra, and it calls it the Mishra machine. Had recovered from the avalanche and was now charging up the hill, its dragon head screaming. Urza looked up and saw his brother's face half torn from the metallic skull beneath and wept for him. And so basically 
they're they're trying to figure out what could do it and they're saying everything they're saying the brother's close so it might be some kind of symp uh, sympathetic resonance between the two maybe it takes more than one person to be focused it needs to be a heightened emotional state it could be the proximity of phyrexian technology so kai is just listing all these things like it could be any of these things we need to know which one it is they need to recreate it as best as they can if they want to try and activate the silex and so as teferi is watching all these things happen, the, the, uh, the mishra machine had attained the hilltop now and its serpent head loomed high above them mishra was grinning the smile half flesh half steel it was the grin of a man triumphant mishra was screaming something a flash at the base of the bowl a flash at the base of the bowl a flash at the base a flash stop teferi just gets flung back to the present and he gets out right but like he just he pukes because it's just this extremely powerful moment and his everything is just like his body can't take being in that time the time stream that way so all of that happens and now he finally goes in for his last jump and he's there again and it's in argoth and here we see a bit more like context for what's going on this is a black sky a rain lashed beach ticking and twitching metal ruins still dragging themselves toward their enemies two titanic constructs collapse across each other over the wild burning old growth behind him an oil slick wave crashes and roars dragging dead bodies up and down the stained sand this is a war zone this is the destruction of argoth this is not the silex blast yet this is just how terrible the things are after Urza and Mishra have been done with it. This is moments before the end of the world. Quick side note though, the year, the current year is 4562, which is pretty interesting that they would choose to have this year set up the way it is. Because honestly, they could choose any number of years, 4,560 whatever years later. But what they're doing is they're setting it up so that a year from now, we're going to see, like a like in story a year from now, it would be 4563, which would be 4,500 years exactly after Urza activates the Silex, which is a nice little bit of parallelism that they're created here. But besides that, we have Teferi, and he's watching everything unfold again in 63 AR. And it's everything, he's screaming something, a flash at the base of the bowl, and then everything stops at that moment. So basically, Teferi... In this moment, he knew this was the moment that the bowl explodes. So he tried to slow things down as much as he could to get as much information out of this moment as possible to see if Urza does anything specifically. And it says that command over time was an awesome power, godly. Teferi knew it to be ruinous, so he was a careful practitioner. He had thought the answer lay in observation and taking special care with this moment to note every detail of Urza's movements, emotions, and words. There's so much he did not know, so he tried to observe and report on every single thing, even the rain, just in case that was a component of the spell. And so he thinks of all these different things, and none of it helps him. None of them gets him any closer. But he thinks of a way to around it. Because he says, everything could go wrong. But back in his time, everything was already going wrong. Karn was gone. The Phyrexians were on Dominaria. Jaya was dead. Their last... Everything they did was about to come to a crashing down. What was the worst that could happen? Just the end of the multiverse. And so he decides he needed to align his time with Urza's. So this whole time he's been out of phase. But being out of phase, that's made it so that nobody notices him. Nobody feels him, his presence or anything like that. He can't affect the timeline in any meaningful way. Everything prior to that, we've seen that it just winds up with people that are affected dying, so they don't affect the timeline in any massive way. It's all been little things. So then, at this moment, he knows what he has to do. And it says here, it was a terrible risk. He waited. Urza did not die on the side of his No one knew how he came back or when, but Teferi knew him. When he was young, he had studied under him. Just because Urza lived, it did not mean that Teferi, or even his spirit, could survive the blast. So Teferi knows that what he's doing could actually completely end him. And so he stops holding back time and the Silex explodes. And in that moment, Teferi doesn't know where he is. It says, what remained of Urza sat cross-legged on a scrape of Urgothian earth. So in the, like, because remember he was sitting down with the bull and his blood was falling into it and Mishra was coming at him. And here in this moment, the blast happens and it's as if it's still mid explosion and Mish and, and Urza and Teferi are able to see each other in this moment. It says Teferi stood a short distance away, a spirit in soft hues. He could see little of Urza behind the light emitting from the Silex, but enough to make out the planeswalker silhouette inside the detonation. 
Together, the two of them were alone in an Empyrean void. And to Teferi, it looked as if they were standing within the belly of a cloud. So in this moment, Teferi, for the first time in forever, is seeing Urza face to face, essentially. And so he says, I need to tell you something about the future. Your future, my present, it concerns everything. And Urza is like, okay. And at this point, like his face has been just like blasted away. It's just a skull kind of thing. And he goes, what? They won't be good things. And Urza being Urza, this is really awesome because we haven't had a chance to see Urza talk in a while. And here he says, curious. He says, one does not expect happy news in a formless void. Is this the afterlife? And Deferi's like, I hope not. <laughs> and Urza goes, okay, well then who are you? And he goes, I'll tell you in a moment. First, I need your help. He says, well, you said you're from my future, that you need my help. How do you know whether you talking to me will change anything? Or worse, maybe it will change everything. And Teferi's like, well, I don't know, but it, it, like, I have to do this. And so we essentially have this moment where Urza and Teferi are able to talk. You go back, you read it. It's beautiful. I love this moment. Both of these are characters that I, I enjoy a great deal. And seeing them actually communicate with each other is really a treat. So it says, you should know first that you are a great man now, as Teferi tells him. But you're nothing like what you will become. And obviously he's talking about the fact that he is going to become a planeswalker. But here it talks about the, he, when he taps the, the Silex and you can see that there's like light still in it. And there's like, it looks like brimming water at the bowl. And the, it says that light was doomed. He was staring at the end of one age and the dawn of another. So the, just the general idea that like this is a nuke. He's in the middle of a nuke trying to talk to a planeswalker. And he tells him, well, what am I going to become then? And as it's all happening, he's still being blasted away like this flesh is blackening and peeling off and all coming off and he's seeing all of this take place and even as it's happening there's already parts of him starting to reform like the stones are starting to move towards his eyes and all this other stuff so it's a really cool moment where you're basically seeing him get stitched like first blown apart and then even then you can see his spark already pulling things together and starting to stitch him back together and so he says so some would probably call you a god others would call you a curse i called you my teacher but most know you as planeswalker and so, as this is all going, he goes, this, there's nothing I can do to change that. Like, Urza's like, because Urza this is an old man at this point. He's, old, he's 60 years old, 63 years old, and he's saying, there's nothing I can do, right? I'm going to become this thing you're saying. I can't stop that. I can't rest knowing I've defeated my brother and brought him peace. And he, at first, like, well, if I'm here, that means that I don't think anything you or I can do to change what will happen. Time does not pass like the hand of a clock. It already happened. And so as that's happening, Urza's asking him, like, what's going on around me? And Teferi goes, can I, can I lecture for a moment? And Urza just kind of sits back and is like, go for it. And so it's really cool, again, seeing Teferi in a state where he's older than Urza, who was an ageless, ancient planeswalker, and Teferi gets to teach him something. And that's super cool to me. I love that there's this moment for Jafari to kind of see the person that he's been compared to throughout these stories and to see a person who is on the basically on the brink of becoming something greater, becoming something more powerful than Jafari, but still being in such a vulnerable position. And so Jafari essentially just explains to him how, how time flows. But what's important here is that he's explaining to him how time works. And we know that Urza eventually starts working with time. What that means is that most likely what's happening here, Urza, even if he doesn't physically remember it, it already had an effect on him going forward. It's a whole bootstraps paradox kind of thing. Because it's saying, people say time flows like a river, but that only imagines time moving forward. And then Urza looks like he, like he's more interested in what he's saying. And he says, that, that is neither totally wrong nor totally right. It's just limited by our perspective. Humans, I mean, we have one angle into the prism of existence. We only ever see time going one way. So to imagine time as a river isn't wrong. And since we're all a part of this, our metaphor contains some of the truth. Rivers are agents of time's passage. They exist on a scale larger than us. They also hold mysteries. If we were able to walk alongside any river, the Mardun maybe, we'd come across places where it tumbles into whirls and eddy, shoots off on little branches that go nowhere, join other rivers, or are snipped off into their own lakes. Those lakes are places where the river stops. If time is a river, then those lakes are moments where time stops. I think we're in one of those right now. So he's basically explaining to him that this is a pocket 
and time when so many things have suddenly come to an end. So many possible futures have been snuffed out of existence. That's the moment they're in right there. They're in a extremely deep basin of existence where time itself is almost wounded. And so essentially he says that, he says, you say in the future I become a teacher. And he says, yeah, many thousands of years from now. And Urza responds by saying, my pedagogy needs work. <laughs> so the basic idea is like, Urza saying, you, you could have used some work here. And so Urza says, what do I need to know so I can tell you what you need to know? And so Teferi essentially reveals to him that the Phyrexians are not defeated. And he's going to spend his entire life fighting them. And he's going to defeat them, but he's not going to fully defeat them. And that's what he needs help with. And what's crazy is Teferi tells him, you lose. The Phyrexians win. You fight them for millennia, but they always win. <laughs> Until eventually you succeed, but you cannot go back. And so basically what ends up happening is that Urza agrees, like, yeah, I guess I, I suppose that's that's how this goes. And what's, this is crazy. To get to the point, despite everything, I do not stop the Phyrexians. You are here having trial the time and away. I could not. Why? And since Teferi could hear the pain in his old instructor's voice, here he was trapped at the moment of his death with a desperate man from the future who told him his war did not end here. That his final act did not grant him any peace, but only unlocked a door holding back an even greater war. One whose trail of ruin was unavoidable, one that would stretch across thousands of years and claim thousands of lives. Had he been a kinder man, Teferi would have stopped talking. He would not have told Urza the truth. And then Teferi thinks to himself, am I as cruel as he is? As necessary, time will tell. And then that's when he explains everything to him. And he says... Well, why not go back to when I first beat the, the Phyrexians? He goes, well, no, that's not going to work because of this and that or whatever. And so he says, we need to use the Silex. And so he basically tells him, give me some room. And it says that the blue light would soon grow to eclipse the setting sun. He sat, he gripped the edge of the bowl and lifted it back onto his lap. Once more, his body began to smolder away, flaking to ash, this time revealing the lattice of light underneath. So he's a, he's a planeswalker now. He stepped beyond his mortality and he is fully a planeswalker. And Urza basically explains to him how he held it and how the blood fell into the bowl. And then he felt the weight of Terracer on his heart. He says he could hear the whole world crying out. He didn't read the runes to understand what they meant. He says there was a woman during the war named Her Hercule. Hercule is mentioned in is part of the College of Latin Am. And he says all these things and he describes magic and how he had never really known what magic was like. But he knew it as the soul of the land, love, pain, joy, fear, emotion, memory, all of it channeled through a single point, through a single person. And so he describes how he did all of that and he poured everything essentially into the bowl and activated it. And he said that as soon as he held it, he knew what to do. That's all he could tell him. And Teferi understood in that moment that the, the worst part is that it wasn't a spell. It wasn't a, some button. It wasn't a, a specific rune that he had to read. It was a person that a person had to activate it by just being there and being the fuel for the fire, being the thing to destroy themselves and everything around them. That that was what the Silex took, was a sacrifice, essentially. It just so happened that in Urza's case, he had a spark and he ignited in that moment into godhood. So that's crazy. And so Teferi basically tells him that I don't think he's going to remember any of this. And then they basically fade apart. And it says 64 AR, there was silence to Terrace Air. And then we have 69 AR, where we get a moment where Urza goes, like it's Urza the planeswalker, and he goes over to Thanos' coffin and he opens it up. And before he, he planes walks away, he tells him, like, this is everything that happened. Go take care of uh, everybody that needs to be taken care of. I'm going to go away. And obviously Urza is still a planeswalker. It's been about five years since, uh, I mean, not five years. It's been about, I believe six years since it, is, it all took place, since everything's been crazy. And then eventually he's back. And when he comes back, this is when everything's taking place the way it is. And we get everything going on from where his story goes. And it's a really cool moment because we actually get to see Thanos and everybody looking at the way things are there. It's just showing that basically the timeline is the same way it was before. It's confirming essentially that all that's the way it is. Now, this last part was actually from the Exodus chapter. But I found that this fit better with this moment right here. It's where we essentially find out what happens on Teferi's side of things. It's the final part, the thing that kind of ties everything together. Remember that Teferi was worried that he wouldn't be enough to be like Urza. But what happens to, Urza, to Teferi is that he's basically nowhere. He finds himself on a beach, it says. And that 
his he, he fills the sand and everything he breathes into the sand he's blinking the grains are irritating his eyes meaning that he is physically there and he's realizing that this is not where he's supposed to be <laughs> and he said that he felt fine rested confused as if he had woken from a nap and he looked around taking in the coast on which he stood and he's looking around he doesn't know where he is or when he is and he can't hear kaya he can't hear anything he's completely adrift and this is this was not the time to panic this was only a problem just another obstacle to overcome he looked up the beach toward the old footprints in the sand there were people here there were people there was hope to ferry put his back to the ocean and started walking inland now this is something that i hadn't thought of until just now because obviously I, I, I look at the stories and I try to understand and try to come, uh, come up with the possibilities. But in this moment just now, I considered what if the Silex is kind of like a soul stone scenario where it's such an, uh, you, like a, an, a total annihilation kind of deal that it actually just obliterated the Phyrexianized parts or the, the, the impure parts and just all the people, the souls that are there are kept in this area. That's unlikely, I know. More like the most likely thing I would expect would be Equilor. That's what I initially thought, is that he's in the oldest plane ever to exist. Because that would also be cool, because that could help him to try and figure out what he's doing. But the general idea is that Teferi is still alive. We have no idea where or when he is and how that's going to affect everything else going forward. Even when it showed the year for that scene, it was a bunch of question marks. So it's really interesting. It's super cool. We're going to be moving into Phyrexia now. We've already seen spoilers. We know the Koth is alive. We know that some characters won't be. The fact that some of those characters showed up earlier when the actual thing is part of the team makes me think they could be sleepers. If they are sleepers, it's going to make them very dangerous going forward. Also explains why some of them, like Jace, were so eager to actually go to Phyrexia and get this over with as opposed to continue planning. It's really interesting. It's really exciting. I'm wondering how things are going to shake out. And I'm looking forward to talking about it with you guys and Joe when he returns from his oil bath. Until next time, travel well.